Yeah, loud and clear.
check. Hello, everyone. Welcome everyone. I hope, I trust everyone had a good lunch. And now we're headed for the engaging interactive storytelling format, uh, which helps to capture audiences' attention uh, while also delivering key messages. Um, and so right now what we have is a Pecha Hucha format. We have nine case studies of solutions and pathways which will be presented showcasing system level interventions uh, for resilience, cities uh, and informal settlement solutions as well as the transport sector resilience solutions. I'll now introduce our moderator, Ms. Savina Carluccio. She is, uh, pardon me, I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. She's the executive director of the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure an experienced civil engineer and infrastructure practitioner. She has 20 years experience advising government, infrastructure owners and operators 
multilateral development banks and NGOs to develop and implement sustainable and resilient infrastructure that is fit for the future. She was previously head of guidance and standards at the Resilience Shift, as well as associate director and infrastructure advisor at Arup. She serves as a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers Advisory Board for the Sustainable Resilient Infrastructure Community. So I'll hand it over to Ms. Carluccio. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, welcome everyone to the solution for a change enabling governments ecosystems for infrastructure resilience session. So this is going to be an action packed session that will feature nine case studies of solutions and pathways to enhancing resilience of infrastructure systems. So this year we have pushed the boundaries of case study presentation and challenged each presenter to tell us their stories in just 10 slides that will advance automatically with 20 seconds on each slide. So this format, uh, as Ashwarya was saying, is called Pechikucho, Pechikucha, which in Japanese means chit-chat. So it's the first one of three Pechakucha sessions at the ICDRI, so we are the pioneers for this session. And uh, we're really looking forward to, the, to some engaging storytelling today. So we will hear from our presenters first about a variety of solutions, spanning geographies and regions, from using data and technology to improve governance and communication systems, to leveraging partnership approaches. So if all goes to plan, at the end of this session, we will have a Q&A with both the physical and the virtual audiences. Um, and so if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us today. Please interact with us and send us your question at any time, specifying the presenter or the case study your, your question is directed to. And we will take it at the end. And for the physical audience, there will be a microphone in the room. So, without any further ado, let's get started with the Pecha Kucha presentations. So, the first three presentations will be exemplified system level interventions. So, allow me to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Samantha Burgess. She's a Deputy Director of Copernicus Climate Change Service at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast. And Samantha will be speaking about clim using climate data for decisions. So over to you, Samantha. Tell us when you're ready to start. Thank you very much. OK, so good afternoon, everyone. And I have great pleasure to present today and speak to you about the Copernicus Climate Change Service, which for brevity, I'll shorten to C3S. So um, the Copernicus Climate Change Service really provides data for society. And I'm sure everyone in the room and online is very much aware of how rapidly our climate is changing. However, I, I like to start every presentation with this polar view of our planet, which really shows the extensive change over the last 70 years. And, and this change has been caused by humans. So on to C3S. C3S is an operational climate service embedded in the Copernicus Earth Observation Program, implemented by ECMWF together with over 300 public and private entities from more than 40 countries in Europe and elsewhere. C3S is one of six Copernicus services funded by the European Commission to enable citizens to access data. We do this by providing a nexus between data and society. So we have close to 200,000 direct users on our climate data store, where we convert petabytes of data into kilobytes of information for society. Obviously, the climate is a complex system and, and we leverage the global climate observing system, which has defined over 54 ECVs, essential climate variables. Of these 54, we have approximately half available for free, quality assured in our climate data store. This is really important because when we're looking at climate change, we really need to understand different time periods. So we have observations and reanalysis from the past, reanalysis and seasonal predictions from the present, and then climate projections for the future. And we are not locked into a future. We, we as society have the ability to change which future we have. Reanalysis is our most popular product, and this enables us to do things like this. So this is a very famous photo of the Earth um, of 
taken by NASA in 1972. And on the right hand side, we've recreated that period point in time through our reanalysis. Another example of using reanalysis has been through ARENA, which has looked at ERA 5 and to understand how Africa can become a more resilient and more reliant using renewable energy resources. So you can see here the brown and the green are solar and, and wind resources, looking at where the best places are for those resources. Finally, we need to monitor our climate. So we apply and provide a range of climate indicators to understand this rate of change. This also enables us to communicate more broadly with other communities. And my uh, penultimate slide is using the, the IPCC Climate Atlas, which was released uh, two years ago now with Working Group One. And it enables people to understand not only the climate uh, change of where they are, but also the potential climate change in the future. Another example of how we're applying this data to understand our, our future challenges that we face as society is this uh, simple application to understand how we're, when we are going to reach 1.5 degrees. So you can see on this graph, we've done a simple linear extrapolation. And the reality is we've got less than 10 years left before we hit this uh, 1.5 degree target. So action using data is more critical than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha, for this great presentation. I um, have a question for you. Um, so now you've got all this climate data and uh, what is the biggest barrier that you see for people to start using it? I think um, actually hearing about us is the biggest barrier. So uh, we, as I mentioned, we have over 200,000 users and our data is interoperable. It's harvestable by Google, Google Earth Engine, Amazon Cloud. But this is, it is mainly academics and very data literate people that use us. So it's getting into the government departments, getting into the decision making bodies around the world to enable them to understand that they can use this data, use it in a simple way, as well as the more complex things that can be done from the same data. That's really the challenge that I see. All right. Thank you very much, Samantha, again. Thanks again for your contribution. We're ready now to move to the next presenter. Uh, a welcome to the stage, uh, Ms. Junsun Lim. She's an energy and environmental policy analyst at the International Energy Agency, and she will be speaking about climate resilience in energy systems. So thank you for coming, uh, Junsun. Yeah, welcome, and uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jinsheng Lim uh, from the International Energy Agency. I would like to introduce our work on the climate resilient electricity systems. So climate change directly affects every segment of the electricity value chain from power generation to consumption. So as you can see, the rising temperatures can affect the generation and transmission efficiency while increasing the demand for the cooling and also extreme weather events and sea level rises, they can make the damage to the assets as well. So the level of the climate change risks will be determined by our emissions pathway. According to our assessment for power systems, climate change risks could be comparatively manageable under the low emission scenario. However, under a high emission scenario, it will be extremely challenging. The red and orange dots indicate uh, an alarming level of risks. You can see that every single segment of the power system, they have at least one red dot. So how would these risks pose challenges to actual operation of the power systems? So I would like to introduce a case study of climate impacts on hydropower. This map shows that hydropower plants are projected to be exposed to a wetter or drier climate depending on their lo locations. So climate change is projected to decrease average hydropower generation in many countries, including South and Southeast Asia, by around 5% uh, until the end of this century. In a higher emission scenario, it can decrease further in overall while increasing the variability of the generation. So in the next slides, I would like to also show the case of the Latin American hydropower. In Latin America, the hydropower accounts for 
5% of the electricity generation. And you can see that there, uh, the adverse impacts of climate change are likely to be more significant, leading to 11% less hydropower generation. In a higher emission scenario, it will reach 17%. To address the negative impacts of the climate change, we need climate resilience. And we believe it consists of four different uh, components, readiness, robustness, resourcefulness, and recovery. So building climate resilient energy systems requires actions from all stakeholders, energy suppliers, consumers, and authorities. Suppliers need to conduct climate risk and impact assessment improve physical systems, and diversify, diversify their supply chain and production process. Consumers, particularly from main and youth sectors, such as buildings, industries, and transport, can contribute to climate resilience through behavior changes, energy efficiency, nature-based solutions, and others. Uh, of course, uh, energy authorities and governments have a very critical role to play to increase the actions from the supply and demand side. Um, they can mobilize actions from all stakeholders by mainstreaming climate resilience into policies and regulations, support financing and insurance, and ensure emergency preparedness. Um, so I would like to emphasize that everyone in this room uh, should collaborate to build a climate resilience in the energy system. Thank you. Great. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, jun -san. You mentioned that um, governments have a critical role to play in building resilience to, uh, resilient energy systems. So what is the biggest gap that you see that exists in taking action? Yes, uh, actually, when we are thinking about the energy sector, we automatically think about mitigation only. So adaptation and resilience discussion have been neglected in the energy sector for a long time. So although there are many countries have a very good adaptation strategy, resilience strategy for the water sector or agriculture sector, and mitigation strategy for the energy sector, they all have very good strategies, but the resilience adaptation consideration for the energy sector has been missing. So according to our assessment, 25% of IA member and also association countries, they are missing those kind of consideration in their energy and climate policies. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Thank, thank you again. You so much. Please join the table. Oh, this way. Okay. Join the table, lovely okay. speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, moving on to the final uh, presenter of this first round of presentation. I welcome to the stage Ms. Magda Magdalena Komarek. Please join us, Magda. She's a project manager, uh, climate change adaptation at DHI, and she will be presenting about strong partnership that offers multidisciplinary solution for climate and disaster and climate resilient transformation. Thank you, Magda, yes. whenever you're ready. Okay, hello everyone. Today I represent the Polaris Center of Excellence, uh, so, and I'm very excited to uh, show you the presentation. Okay, whenever. So, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Isn't it why we are here, coming or connecting from different parts of the world so that together we can work towards a more resilient future? So, there is already a long history of even global efforts to collaborate and work, and work together. And without a doubt, there are some great achievements but there are also limitations. And in fact, we need a transformative shift of how we work together. I always wonder why there is a certain group that is significantly underrepresented in these global discussions. As important as it is to have a common agreement on who commits to what and when, we should have those who deliver those solutions taking part in these discussions. And that includes also the private sector. So those uh, consulting and engineering companies, uh, technology providers, and others who deliver solution. So I wonder how many of you are here from the private sector today. Um, competition is important. It pushes our limits, drives innovation, but it can also limit the potential of 
um, of what we can do together if we partner instead of competing. Having recognized the complementary strengths, three global companies, Nippon Koi, Sorbonne Jurong, and DHI have come together and established the Polaris Center of Excellence. The new partnership can offer complementary expertise in risk mitigation and resilience planning. Together, we have uh, the resources, skills, and technology to make a difference. Thanks to the multidisciplinary context, the Polaris can deliver comprehensive solutions. And isn't it what's important now that climate change adaptation and resilience planning are becoming our priorities? But choosing the right solution requires uh, informed decision making that involves in-depth understanding of the processes and systems involved. And that's what drives the partnership at the Polias. But our collective solutions can only be as good as they can be if they continue meeting the needs of the users in the long term. And that's often a challenge. And because of that, we start looking for new uh, models of operation of how to collaborate together, including public-private partnerships, for example. So, we are all here on a quest to meet ambitious goals. I just keep remembering that together we can do so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Magda. You really embraced the Pecha Kucha format, so thank you for this. Um, I have a question for you. You talked about the Polaris Center of Excellence. Can you give us an example of a project that you executed yeah. together and what were the benefits of that collaboration? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, an example of a project that we did together was actually climate change adaptation disaster uh, decision support system to uh, mitigate uh, the hazard and find uh, uh, adaptive solutions for sea level rise in uh, Singapore. And uh, yeah, we have the awareness of sea level rise being an increasing issue for the coastal cities and islands. Uh, but you know, how much of that understanding we have deeply on what it brings on that local level, how it transforms if this particular locality. So here the purpose was really to uh, build a system that would allow us on one hand to deeply understand the all that's involved in the, in the risk, how it transverse into the city, what actions we can take to actually mitigate that risk and adapt, uh, what the cost benefits of this is, a very comprehensive system that can support decision making. And since it's so comprehensive, it's very difficult to be addressed by just individuals. And uh, we really learned how beneficial it was for the whole project to be in a strong partnership having everyone having his strengths implementing in all of the separate uh, aspects of the project throughout the whole thing. And the final thing that maybe I want to say is that, that you know, in the end, it's about taking ownership and committing to the whole work that we do and also having the strong partnership and people that we're able to mobilize and engage with all the stakeholders really led to the success that uh, this uh, solution that we provided received uh, strong support from the government and endorsement from uh, prime ministers. So, yeah, it's been three years since 2019 and we're very excited to see it leaving and uh, meeting its purpose. Thank you, Magda. Thank <laughs> you so much. Please, um, thank you, Magda, again for her contribution. You can thank join you the speaker's much. table. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we are now on to our next round of presentation. This time the topic is cities, housing and informal settlements. So please welcome to the stage our first presenter, Dr. Hari Kumar. He is the Regional Coordinator for Southeast Asia, Geohazard International. Welcome, welcome Hari. Uh, and he's going to be presenting about resilience study for the city of Haithwan. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Thank Whenever you so you're much. ready. Yes, thanks. I'm going to, I'm going to take you to a, a different world altogether, the world of uh, 
hill cities. The resilience challenges of hill cities is completely different. And the solutions also have to be different. So I'll be taking you to a city in the northeast of India, far east actually, the city of Aizol, uh, which is really prone to landslides and uh, earthquakes. 400,000 people live in this on buildings which are clinging on to slopes. You know, each drop of water they consume is pumped up seven kilometers. They're connected by two roads to the rest of the country. And Geohazards International in 2013 had carried out uh, the study of an earthquake scenario, bringing in, uh, you know, international, national and local uh, experts to find out what exactly will happen if an earthquake strikes size all. And the results were actually uh, traumatizing for even for people from outside, because not just because of the buildings and the losses of people, but because of the 1,100 landslides which will hit the city and knock off water supply, power supply. So this really caught the attention of the decision makers. And also the interdependence, one, one thing I missed saying, the interdependence between the water supplies uh, dependent on the, on the power, the power supplies are dependent on roads for restoration, and so on. So this caught the attention of the decision makers, uh, and because there were also a lot of solutions being offered by the scenario. Uh, the solutions were really sector-wise, bite-sized solutions. Because of their interest, it gave us an opportunity, a window of opportunity to bring it all in together into a long-term risk mitigation plan. And the city has been actually ticking the boxes, achieving targets year by year. They have their one, one is to 5,000 scale hazard map. They have geologists in panel. They have slope modification regulations. They worked on water supply uh, risk mitigation. They started with one source, single source water supply. Now they have three sources and two different pipelines. So a lot of work has been done by the city of Aizol which all started with one earthquake scenario. The scenario really opened the doors for us, but the hard work had to follow. A lot of work had to be done because the scenario only, you know, it starts the conversation. But to encourage mitigation takes a long time and a long series of work. So right from 2013 to till now and continuing, we have been working closely with the government of Mizoram to take them forward towards resilience and and it has been a, a very very engaging journey with them and i believe that many other hill cities have to take these steps forward as well so let us actually focus more and throw more light on the the hill cities and continue working closely with them this is a, a, a section which needs a lot of support from the rest of us thank you so much in time. Great job, great job. Thank you, Hari. Um, so you talked about collaboration efforts. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how these efforts were formed and how they were nurtured? Uh, when, when we were developing the scenario also, actually we brought in international and a lot of national experts and the local experts. Actually, the international experts have been doing scenarios for a long time. Whereas the national experts understand the, you know, the political will or lack of will, the, the codes, they understand that. The local people understand what it is to live in a city with so much of risk. So we had actually brought them all together. And normally, it's very, very difficult to get all, a lot of people to work together. In, in ISOL, uh, the I forgot to mention that they have a landslide policy committee, which actually brings in different sectors. The geologists come in from the geology department, the PWD civil engineers come together, the architects come all together into one landslide policy committee to work towards making the city resilient towards uh, landslide hazards. That is what that, and they together form that long-term risk mitigation plan. So it's actually collaboration with the government, with other agencies, international, national, local, everyone coming together to work towards resilience. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Adam. you. Thanks a lot. All right. We are halfway through our presentations. I hope you're enjoying our Pachacucha uh, pitches today. 
Um, may I invite uh, on the stage Ms. Regina Opondo. She's a senior community principal at Conque Design Initiative. Hi, Regina, welcome. And she okay. will be talking about the 3F three, the three initiative for informal settlements in Kenya. Over to you. Thank Hi. you very much. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. Designing for dignity. When I first joined KDI, uh, one of our colleagues in a team meeting said that's the thing he liked most about KDI. So we are a community design and development organization, and we have been working with underserved communities since 2006, um, starting in Kibera, an informal settlement in Nairobi, and spreading out to the rest of the world in the US and Sweden. We deliver on our mandate through design and building, working with residents to transform safe, unsafe and underutilized sites into productive public spaces, planning and programming to create plans and programs that advance their long-term visions, research and testing because data is king or queen, and advocating and educating by leveraging our work networks to shape policy and practice. Our flagship project, the Kibera Public Space Project, KPSP, um, these are hubs of cultural exchange, economic activity, and environmental remediation. They provide water, sanitation, leisure, and laundry facilities, and also reduce flood risks, amongst others, through green infrastructure. A picture is worth a thousand words, especially when you only have 20 seconds. So that's our first public space, um, the one at the top, and you can see it was an abandoned site full of health hazards, pollution, etc. And working with the community, we were able to transform it into a productive public space. So over the years, our public spaces have grown from 1 to 11, spread across Kibera, and bringing together a spine of cultural activity, economic and livelihood improvement, environmental improvements, and lots of opportunities changing the landscape of Kibera. So our approach stands on three pillars, participation, integration, and network change. Participation working with, not for, he or she who wears the shoe knows where it pinches most, addressing complex challenges with holistic solutions through integration. Design alone cannot solve inequality. And then network change, connecting people and places to build equity. So over the years, we observed that infrastructure tends to be planned and implemented with a very narrow perspective. Specific solutions for specific needs, which often means that sometimes we put the people we work for, the most vulnerable, at risk again. And this is compounded by climate change and growing inequality. So ladies and gentlemen, introducing the Inclusive and Integrated Infrastructure Framework 3IF, which is a collaborative effort to create a framework for infrastructure delivery uh, it's a coming together of perspectives from uh, community, professionals in the built environment, academy, policy, advocacy. Simply, 3IF is integrating disciplinary expertise and integrating systems, including the excluded and the users. Five principles that underpin it are one, rights and the city, two, social and ecological balance, three, collaboration and co-design, four, safety and resilience, reviewing and revising. These principles can be used to inform initial conceptions of projects and decision-making processes throughout the project life. So nothing for us without us. We're in the process of developing, um, finalizing the People's Guide, which is a practical guidebook for community-based actors, civil society, as well as communities themselves. Testing and refining the 3IF and getting feedback, so please give us your feedback, and targeted outreach, and we hope for institutionalization. As I conclude, a tree has roots in the soil, yet it reaches the sky. Thank you. Thank you so much, Regina. Thank you, that's a great project. Um, what is, uh, if I may ask, what is one critical thing that you've learned from implementing this public space projects? Okay, I think for me, especially coming from the community perspective, is that people have the solutions to their problems. And so centering the voices less hard allows you to bring in place practical solutions. So it would never have occurred to us that um, women need a place to socialize and to do their chores and also be able to keep an eye on their children. So that's the practical need of putting a laundry pad next to the play area so that they can hang out, but they can also take care of their kids and also do their laundry. So practical solutions for practical problems and the people have it. Great point. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, Regina. All right, so the, let me welcome the third presenter for, for this round, um, Ms. Ashta Pragdanhang. She's a project manager in People in Need. Please join us on the yeah. stage, Ashta. 
Uh, she'll be talking about durable local solutions for disaster resilience and inclusion. Over to Thank you. you so much. Uh, so good afternoon everyone, I'm Asa Pradhanang and I'm representing people in need. So I'll be talking about the durable local solution for disaster resilience and inclusion. So as you can see in the picture, Nepal earthquake 2015 and its subsequent aftershock destroyed 7 million USD, 7 million worth of infrastructure, killed 8,500 plus lives and injured more than 22,000 people. So People in Need focused its early recovery agenda on infrastructure and rehabilitation and relocation solutions just such as land, housing and property, working side by side with the local communities um, in some of the most hard to reach areas of Nepal to find the uh, durable localized solutions. So using the facilitation approach, PIN unlocked governmental grants worth uh, USD 43 million after earthquake for, uh, uh, for the last mile population like displaced and the landless populations to relocate and uh, rebuild after earthquake. However, the team uh, in Nepal uh, after the earthquake over the last seven years have observed increase in cascading hazards such as landslide and debris flows. Along with the expo increasing exposure to climate-induced hazards and different vulnerabilities, deeply rooted in the lack of access and inclusion, reversing the hard winds of the development and post-disaster reconstructions. Based on the exposure to landslide, you could see in the uh, picture, the settlements are categorized into three different categories. Category three being the settlement in need of relocation. This helps in targeting the anticipatory actions, but holistically intervene the landscape for relocation, risk reduction, prevention, early actions, and overall DRM, including Build Back Better. We're currently working with the government of Nepal across all tiers of government for systematic and inclusive solutions with the potential to unlock grants and social safety nets in the process to learn how to live with disaster, being it flood, landslide, or drought. The major problem has been the pillars of climate change and disaster risk reduction not being integrated. And the evidence-based uh, climate change data is not adequately considered while planning and response. So the communities most at the risk and impacted by climate change are not receiving targeted support as they are supposed to. So, to holistically and efficiently address the disconnection between DRR and climate change at all levels uh, in the government through a local-led inter, uh, intersectorial approach, PIN is currently working with local stakeholders in mainstreaming climate change into local-level planning. To through co-producing an interactive tool called Climate Change Toy Model. So it is a decision-making tool for local government and communities to identify longer-term climate change impact and make investment on sustainable and resilient infrastructures. For an instance, it could be a multi-hazard resilient climate-friendly houses for the disaster-prone communities. So this will be applied through an adaptable and systematic approach that it is multi-hazard and specific to unique local context. We are currently taking baby step for now, but it has a potential to be scaled up and replicated across the country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asta. Thank you for sharing this. Um, I have a question about this climate change toy model you talked about. How can you tell us a bit more? How will this be used by local government to support investment decision making? Oh, so in terms of uh, decision making, actually, climate change toy model gives the future shows the future impact of climate change, how exposure and risk uh, would actually look like in the foreseeable future in different emission scenarios. So this means that local government will make plans accordingly, um, uh, policies in terms of actually going for the infrastructure considering the future scenarios uh, as predictable by the model. For an instance, uh, if you talk about the flood death, it won't only consider the current scenario, but will also consider the future scenarios in like what what would be the flood depth in like next 20 years or 50 years and have the infrastructure likewise. And we are also actually considering different approaches while we are doing this. So one is the human-centered approach and the other one is citizen science and also intersectionality approaches across. So through citizen science, what we are actually doing is we, we are actually working with the communities there, the CSOs, and uh, we are taking the indigenous knowledge from them and actually overlay the scientific 
information on it so that it will be a better solution for everyone in terms of, especially for the multi-hazard approach. All right, thank you so thank much, Hasta. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so we are ready to move to the final um, set of presentations, and this time we are uh, focusing on transport and the transport sector um, and explore solutions and approaches for that specific sector. So I'd like to invite, we've got a virtual speaker, and we've got uh, Arif Hussein joining us online, joining us from Ottawa in Canada, so it's quite late for you. Thank you, Arif, for joining us and staying up so late to contribute to this session. Very much appreciated. So, Arif Hussain is a policy advisor, uh, climate change adaptation policy at Transport Canada. And uh, Arif will be talking about Transport Canada's work on climate resilience and adaptation. Thank you, Arif, over to you. Sabina, I am delighted to be here today to present Transport Canada's work on strengthening its climate resilience. Transport Canada is responsible for ensuring that uh, Canada's transportation system is safe and secure, efficient, and environmentally responsible. However, a change in climate and extreme weather events pose risks and opportunities to Transport Canada's ability to execute this mandate. As a result, in 2011, uh, Transport Canada identified climate risks to the department, and based on the results of this risk scan, developed Transport Canada's first adaptation plan. The plan consisted of 28 actions centered on two overarching goals, one to strengthen climate change adaptation knowledge and capacity, and two to improve how the department integrates climate change adaptation into decision making. In 2017, we conceptualized the development of Transport Canada's second climate change adaptation plan by conducting a climate risk assessment with a broader range of assets, operational uh, policy and program functions, as well as climate data. With that framework in place, we identified, analyzed and evaluated climate risks and opportunities to the department and developed risk treatment and adaptation for those risks. The risk assessment and the adaptation plan included extensive consultations and resulted in 36 adaptation actions to support Transport Canada's mandate. I, I should highlight uh, that the actions are about Transport Canada and not the sector as a whole, uh, but the plan does acknowledge where actions will benefit the sector. The actions are grouped under four strategic goals goals such as strengthening the department's knowledge and capacity on adaptation, embedding climate considerations in the department's decision-making process, and demonstrating continued leadership on transportation adaptation. Let me just conclude by mentioning three key features of our plan that might be of interest uh, to the audience. One, we found it useful to integrate our adaptation work with broader strategic priorities, uh, such such as uh, the uh, federal adaptation commitments in Canada's Greening Government Strategy. And number two, recognizing that climate risks evolve and new risks can emerge, we have deliberately developed an evergreen approach to the five-year plan. This means new or evolving climate risks and opportunities can be considered and the resulting actions be added during the duration of the plan. And finally, a results-based management framework to track progress on measuring the effectiveness of the actions and to demonstrate results. Back to you, Savina. Can I ask, um, from your, the work you've done at Transport Canada, what do what you think are the lessons learned that would be uh, applicable to others that we can learn from? Uh, thank you, Savina. At, at the outset, um, an organizational climate risk assessment, which helps inform an organization's adaptation plan or equivalent, uh, cannot be done at the edge of, the, of, at the edge of a desk. Um, as Dr. Kumar also mentioned in, in his presentation, um, a risk assessment requires significant engagement. In the 
interest of time, uh, I'll just share three key lessons. One, you need support from your senior management team. When we were developing our second adaptation plan, we sought approval from the department's executive management committee on the proposed approach, and we provided them with regular updates. Equally important are the people whose input will be invaluable uh, in the comprehensiveness of your risk assessment and adaptation plan. Uh, second is to have a realistic scope for what you want to include in your climate risk assessment, how the work will be done, uh, which type of um, RCP scenario to use, the projection time frame. This will likely lead to a more manageable process and clearer outcomes. Another important element is the measuring, monitoring, reporting, and the feedback loop in general uh, needs to be kept in mind when conceiving the level of ambition uh, of the plan. And finally, um, while the causes of adaptation are due to climate science, the impacts of it often result in economic, social, and safety repercussions. It's Unfortunate that climate risks are often linked to an organization's environmental agenda, but in reality, in reality, it is a, a very strategic horizontal issue. One of the ways that we overcame that was throughout the risk assessment and adaptation plan, we presented very concrete relevant examples on how slow onset of climate impacts and extreme weather events could pose financial safety and or reputational risks. And by doing so, senior management were willing to engage more and appoint a much broader range of people to work with us than merely an environmental expert. Great, thank you Arif and thank you for staying with us uh, at, this, at this time uh, in, your, mm -hmm. in your day should say night. Um, so moving on to the next uh, presenter, uh, can I invite uh, Dr. Ujiwal Sur? Please join us on the stage. He is the Deputy General Manager at Nippon Koi, India, and he will be presenting uh, his case studies on building future-proof railway corridor in a changing climate. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be part of this ICDRI conference. So let's start. The dedicated freight corridors are a unique type of heavy haul transport for India, particularly to decongest the Indian railway tracks between, initially between New Delhi and Mumbai, and the other one is New Delhi with Kolkata. So this is the mainly a heavy haul transport that is a faster, cheaper, and convenient solution for, uh, for the freight transport at a high speed having double stack containers and faster movement. This will provide a good support. Uh, at present, the movement of these tracks are highly uh, sometimes affected by uh, climate change and natural disaster like flood, earthquake, uh, and other type of natural disasters. So therefore, there is a need to address the issue and include the, the overall uh, scenario inside. You can look at this photo because of the heavy torrential rain, there is slope instability already in the system. Accordingly, there is due to high temperature, there is buckling of the railway tracks. So all this needs to be addressed carefully to, in order to protect the interest of the nation and the movement forward. For example, the climate change. To address the issue, there is huge amount of infrastructure and the repetition cost should be involved. Therefore, there should be a coalition and there should be multiple players who can address these issues properly. So several adaptation measures has already been taken in this project, particularly in terms of uh, early warning system, the railway infrastructure system, the monitoring, train, train management system, and everything has been taken care considering 100 year design period so that the resilient transport infrastructure can be offered. Particularly, not a single infrastructure element. This is a $9.8 billion project. So to make sure this project for long term, there are many players who are contributing at national, international level, as well as between the public and private sectors. This is the state of the art 
uh, operation control center, which is equipped with early warning system. You can see the entire network, and they know in case of there is any seismic activity, the train will stop, and the immediately the information will be conveyed to the control center for necessary action. So such kind of resilience are very important. Another example is transport sector are globally important for a uh, huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Suppose this uh, truck on train, the solar power, rainwater harvesting, all these will contribute towards reduction of approximately 450 ton of carbon dioxide in long term by DFC. So this is the dedicated freight corridor of India, the vision of our honorable prime minister to develop a climate and trans uh, resilient and disaster resilient infrastructure and hope it will serve the nation to the Make in India initiative and we we'll look forward uh, to a new beginning and future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. P perfect timing. Thank you. And great presentation. Can I just ask you, what are the key aspects of strengthening the resilience of dedicated freight corridor infrastructure, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, that is one of the key aspects that we are discussing in this session of ICDRI. So that is mainly the risk information system and the early warning system. For such a huge infrastructure, this has to be in place properly to address all the issues. On top of that, there should be institutional capacity building so, so that multiple players can contribute and the interest of the public money can be secured in long term, and we can come forward and provide innovative solution that not only for one year, two year, or any of the short term, but long term solution that can provide and contribute in the nation building. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Thank, Thank you again you, for your contribution. Thank you. And we've come to the last of our presenters. Uh, please welcome Dr. Madhubashita Hera. Uh, he's an associate professor and senior lecturer at Uba Ulasa University, Sri Lanka. Uh, please join me on the stage, Dr. Herat. Uh, he is going to be talking about the development of a distributed optical fiber sensor technology uh, to enable monitoring on a road network. But thank you, and over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, today I'm going to talk about an ongoing research project which is uh, supported under the CDRI fellowship program that we are doing in collaboration with the University of Southern Queensland in Australia. Let's start. Road infrastructure is a crucial public asset as it contributes to economic development and growth while bringing valuable social benefits. It connects communities and businesses and provides access to education, employment, social and health services. Heavy rains and flood hurricanes cause road collapse that results in life-threatening catastrophes and road run. closure. Have you got the rapid rise in pore water pressure can be the major root cause. However, the real-time condition monitoring is yet to be explored and implemented. The cost of emergency repair of road is estimated to be 10 times that of the planned maintenance. Therefore, Condition monitoring and preventive maintenance have gained significant cost and safety advantages for road infrastructure. Road development authorities seek to implement automated evaluations of roads condition. Currently, mobile devices containing high resolution cameras, sensors and powerful processors are being researched for road inspection. Also, discrete sensors embedded into the roads are widely used. Satellites and unmanned aerial vehicles also detect ground motions. Recent advancement in optical fiber sensing have gained immense interest in engineering. The light transmitted from one end to the other end of the fibers can sense the environmental changes as well as transmit signals for longer distance. The transmitted and reflected optical spectrum changes are measured. Optical fiber sensors laid along a road offers unique advantages for spatially distributed measurements for hundreds of kilometers, which is incapable of existing discrete sensing systems. Optical fiber sensors can detect the damage's precise location, magnitude, and propagation over time. Herein, we develop a three-in-one sensor that is capable of measuring pore water pressure and detecting vertical and horizontal ground motions. 
Specifically, pore water pressure detector was developed by embedding a bare optical fiber into a pressure-sensitive silicon diaphragm that changes its strain as the water pressure increases. The sensor performance was tested through laboratory experiments. High-resolution optical backscatter reflectometer was used to record continuous data. It was proven that real-time measurements can be obtained frequently from a remote location for condition monitoring of road infrastructure. These sensors are designed to have a long life cycle. Also, optical fiber sensors have insensitivity to electromagnetic interference. Remote powering and integrating capabilities will promote the proposed technology to be a promising solution for geohydrological monitoring. In the future, optical fiber sensor-based condition monitoring can be advanced by developing machine learning-based early warning systems. Such robust early warning systems will be an effective tool to reduce vulnerabilities and improve preparedness and response to natural hazard. And thank you very much. Many thanks, Dr. Herat, for this great presentation. Thank you. I'm curious, um, this uh, sensor technology, um, is it more broadly applicable than to just uh, road infrastructure monitoring? Is there any other broader application? Yes, the optical fiber sensors are uh, currently being used for structural health monitoring of bridges and buildings. So here we propose a, a novel sensor system that can be uh, used for geo-technical uh, monitoring. So apart from roads, this can be used for uh, airport runaways and also for mining industry. And not limited for uh, water and ground motions, so optical fiber sensors are sensitive to temperature as well, so that it will be useful for geothermal monitoring also. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Herat, please join the other speakers. Um, and that's the end of our uh, Pecha Kucha sessions. Um, over the last hour or so, I hope you've uh, found as enjoyable as I, as I have this journey through all these different case studies. I first of all want to congratulate all of our presenters for really raising to the challenge of the Pecha Kucha presentation. It's not something that is done um, as a business as usual, but I think it's a, it's a great format and uh, I hope you find it as engaging as, as I did. Let's just look back to all the case studies that we've seen today. So we have started from system level interventions where we heard about use of climate data to inform sector specific insights for infrastructure planning. We then heard about energy system resilience and multidisciplinary solutions to enable a resilience transformation in the water sector. We then zoomed in into the cities uh, and housing and informal settlements and that's some fascinating examples about landslide and earthquake resilience or urban assets. Um, we heard about water infrastructure design and delivery in infrastructure in informal settlements and then about post-disaster resilient and inclusive housing recovery. And then finally, we took a deep dive into the transport sector, learning about the real world experience of policymakers trying to put uh, climate resilience and adaptation policies into practice. We, have, we heard about building climate resilient rail corridors and a sensor technology concluding for road condition monitoring that has actually great potential for transferability and scalability. So it's interesting to me, just to reflect on this, it's interesting to, to, to me how many of these presentations talk about people and talk about engagement and talk about partnerships. So I think this is a very strong common denominator for, for many of these case studies, but also strikes me as um, the recipe for scaling up resilience. We don't have a single recipe for scaling up resilience, but it's likely to, go, to be a mix of soft solutions, so the partnership, the collaboration, the policies, the approaches, and also the hard, the more physical infrastructure solutions and the technology as well. So we learned a lot from our presenters today, and I hope uh, this case studies, and this is the hope that will be of inspiration to others as well. Uh, and, uh, and I think we are now ready to uh, start the final part of this session, which is the Q&A. So, um, just checking if there's any question in the room first. Um, anyone who would like to ask a question to any of our presenters could be a question directly specifically to one of them or just a, a general question. Yep. 
Can I ask one question? Please. Can, I, can we have your name, please? And, uh... I'm Abhay Agarwal. I'm from Munster and Young. So I have rather two questions. I think the Kenya presentation was impressive. I just want to ask her that what did she do with all the waste? And how did she control that? Also on the energy systems in terms of transmission in high temperature, how to, I mean, what is the intervention to really cool them? Okay, so it's a, I think there's a question for the energy systems. And then the first one, sorry, to just... Uh, Kenya, urban spaces. Okay. Yes. Very interesting case. Thank you. Can, does anyone want to answer, please? Oh, thank you. Um, so a, a lot of the waste, um, what, what we normally do actually with all our activities is have a community cleanup before we start an event. That's the way to launch the actual activity. Uh, once we do the community cleanup, we engage the county to come and pick up the garbage and then dispose of it as the county does. Um, where it is possible, um, then sometimes we also recycle some of the material, but most often a lot of that is not stuff you can recycle. But the group that we saw there has actually also set up a recycling plant on site where they recycle plastic as well, which they collect from the neighboring community, which is all now also reducing um, the incidences of that waste ending up in the dam. Thank you. And uh, yeah, Chinsan, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question about the uh, impacts of the heat on the transmission and distribution lines. Uh, related to that question, to enhance the uh, resilience of those kind of electricity network, we are thinking about uh, some several uh, ways. The first thing is about uh, innovative technologies to ensure more insulation better in the transmission and the distribution line better. And the second one is we are more widely using smart metering and smart monitoring system to ensure that real-time monitoring can guarantee that there, if there is any kind of disruption happen, if there is any kind of efficiency drop significantly so that we can uh, respond to that kind of changes more immediately with using other uh, existing lines and options. Thank you, Jensen. Any other questions? Yes, please. So my question is for Dr. Arif from Transport Canada. Uh, so you talked about your adaptation strategy. Uh, you talked about using different RCP scenarios, but the different RCP scenarios are so different. Uh, and there's a fair bit of uncertainty about how they will manifest themselves at the local level. So in such a situation of uncertainty, what, how do you plan for uh, transport infrastructure where you're going to, your investments are going to get locked in for the long term? How are you dealing with uncertainty yeah. and surprises in uh, making investment decisions? Thank you uh, so much for that question. So that was a, so, Throughout the risk assessment, um, we had to make some very hard decisions, recognizing that there are un, there, that there is a high degree of, un, of of uncertainty whether you use a low case scenario of a lower end um, RCP or a high end scenario. We made the decision to use uh, RCP eight point five. Uh, simply because it was the most efficient way of completing the risk assessment. And what we were aiming for by doing that was the worst of the worst scenario. And therefore the types of decisions that will be that will have to be made now in order to protect those assets in the future. Thank you, Arif. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Yes, please. Uh, John Smith Sreen with uh, USAID India. Question to Jimson. Um, a lot of our interaction with interlocutors, uh, particularly from Bhutan, Nepal, and India, uh, they've expressed concern over a warming planet and the impact on glacial uh, melt. Uh, I'm wondering whether IEA has done any modeling or assessments or what data there is out there to measure that impact on hydropower uh, within South Asia? And how can we, given that scenario, enhance the resilience of hydropower uh, resources in this region? Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the question. So actually, we have conducted our research on the climate impact assessment on South and Southeast Asian hydropower, including uh, the countries you mentioned. And we also uh, took a take uh, took a look about the uh, impact of the glacial melting, faster one. But I should admit that there was uh, really difficulties in terms of the climate modeling and hydrological modeling, because even the existing hydro logical models, they are considering different level of the impact and assumptions about the glacial melting speed and the size. So what we are currently doing is that we are planning to update our models this year uh, together with the AR6 scenario from the IPCC uh, to, uh, with the aims to improve the accuracy of our modeling better and deliver more accurate and precise information to the regional stakeholders. But if you want to take a look at our reports, the current assessment has been already done based on the previous model. Uh, you can find it on our website as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the room? Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask a question to, to our presenters to just give them a chance to, um, to tell us a bit more about the case studies. Um, I would like to ask uh, all of you, in a, in a quick, uh, quick fire answer from all of you, um, what are the key barriers that you see in scaling up your solutions? And also, why is the greatest opportunity? So let's not just focus on the barriers, but let's look at the opportunity for scaling this up, your specific solutions. Um, if I may start with Dr. Um, Kumar, please. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, you, you know, we have uh, been talking about taking uh, the windows of opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, in many of our countries, the problem is unless you have gone through this hazard or disaster, you know, the interest, the public interest, the administrative interest is not there. So, which is why we thought, uh, you know, a scenario was a good good way, you know, even without a disaster, you can really explain what is going to happen. So that was uh, a way around the barrier of uh, not getting uh, enough attention without a disaster. I mean, like, uh, even uh, within our country, if, uh, you know, a different state has an earthquake, the rest of the country may not really take notice and make changes. Whereas I keep talking about examples from other countries where even if Los Angeles uh, has an earthquake, the Japanese code will change because they're taking lessons. So I think the barrier is, you know, not enough lessons are learned from past events. That is one of the barriers, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, mic that, please, if I can hear from you. you. Challenges and opportunities. <laughs> Uh, well, I uh, see the greatest challenge to be actually with the potential that we have uh, that can really le reach the people and the societies that need it. To create a system that allows collaborations, not only uh, among the private sector, but also uh, yeah, uh, across different sectors, uh, to reach out and uh, implement whatever we can provide. Great, thank you. Asta, please, your, your thoughts? Thank you so much, Sabina, for the question. So in terms of the climate change toy model that I, I was talking about, so one of the major barriers that uh, is the entanglement of day-to-day -day social and economic sort of problem, which has actually affected the perception of risk for the people. So that has been one of the risks. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, that there hasn't been an integration around the disaster risk reduction and climate change, especially in terms of Nepal. So in that context, when we are talking about um, actually uh, making plans as per the uh, as per the scenario through climate change, so that has been one of the issues that, that could be a barrier. And in terms of opportunities for scaling up, definitely fast-paced digitalization. So almost 90% of the people are already digitally connected through mobile phones. So it gives them a space to actually use the model uh, for decision making. Uh, so that is the case. And it also gives a platform for, the, for climate financing and investment. 
Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you. Regina, quick one from you. Please. Thank you. Um, so barriers are many, but three off the top of my head are limited financial resources for both government and those of us working in this space, lack of planning and coordination amongst government agencies, and generally a weak culture of community participation. So addressing these require coordinated efforts amongst all of us, um, to put our hands together. But opportunities are also many and abounding. So we have quite a friendly legislative and policy framework, which if implemented could actually bring a lot of good. Increasing collaboration and coordination amongst various actors, as you've seen with the framework itself, but also with the work that we do on the ground. And people's interest and uptake and confidence to drive their own governance, but also their own development. Um, and that is also informed and um, facilitated by technology. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Dr. Sir? Please. Thank you. Uh, in my opinion, one of the main constraints is availability of information, particularly the risk information at national level, then coming down to the community level. We don't have an active system that records the localized risk and the participation of the communities into it. So such kind of risk information can, can uh, can result into a better system and it can contribute to the coping capacity of the communities as well as uh, enhance the capability of the government. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Chin San, please. Um, thank you. Um, as uh, Dr. Shuru mentioned, I believe the biggest gap is about the data. He mentioned about localized data, but for me it's more about the sectoralized data. So there are very good data, very well-developed data about the climate change and also the hydrological models currently, but the issue is that um, even the droughts happen in one country, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the hydropower plants need to shut down. It depends on the type of the hydropower. It depends on the turbine type. It depends on the reservoir type and lo location. So I think this kind of interpretation and translation of the climate and hydrological data is really needed. Thank you, jin -san. And Dr. Herat? Yeah, fortunately, the, the sensor system that I'm talking about here is uh, already used for communication purposes. So scaling up is uh, technically it will be much easier. But when it comes to the uh, real implementation, the challenging part is the construction industries who are working on the road construction projects have to uh, come up with new technologies to do this. And also the, the governments and uh, road development authorities have to come up with some pilot projects uh, to implement the new technologies that we are developing at universities. So it will be uh, ultimately a few years time, it will be a real, real life uh, solution. Thank you. Thank you. And then now going to our online uh, speakers. Uh, thank you for being so patient and for staying with us until now. Uh, if I can come to you, Samantha, first. Uh, you, you did give us uh, um, uh, your, you, your views on the barriers before in, in, uh, in your, after your presentation. If you want to maybe just uh, give us uh, some thoughts on the opportunity. Yeah, I think um, I, I spoke about the barriers for uptake of climate data, but there are a number of challenges that we need to overcome. Um, and I, I think there's three challenges that are worth articulating. So the first is the, the lack of understanding of existing climate risk and adapting to your existing climate risk, let alone uh, future potential climate risk. The, there's a lack of coherence across policies across different sectors. So until we get that policy coherence, uh, we, we won't see the, the transition that we require across society. And of course, there's the insurance gap as well. So those most vulnerable to disasters don't have the, the ability or the, the financial security to insure their assets. So of course, when a disaster happens, the, the requirements, the financial requirements are a huge burden, increasing um, lack of equity rather than improving it. In terms of opportunities, I think um, the, the biggest opportunity is that we, we have international policy drivers, so all governments have committed to the Paris Agreement, but we're eight years in from that commitment and, and we're still on a trajectory where, where we're not going to miss those objectives. So the real opportunity is political ambition 
and supporting and rewarding that political ambition, supporting businesses that are also ambitious in adhering to uh, the transition towards a, a low carbon future. And we, we have the innovation in place as well. So it's all about scaling up these innovations and, and opportunities to, to get towards net zero, rather than maintaining the status quo, which is a, a very easy system to maintain, but it, it also keeps us on the existing business as usual trajectory. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. And finally, uh, Arif, uh, just final words from you. Uh, thank you, Sabina. I think organizations worldwide, large and small, have to be commended for the work that they have done in starting to assess climate risks, to disclose those, those risks, and to take action. However, we still have a long way to go in terms of getting a better understanding of major events as they occur. Because the reality is when you have a major disaster, that event is not isolated in one asset or one region. We have cascading impacts crossing multiple sectors in multiple regions. And therefore, one area that we need to focus on more than ever before is on system-wide risk assessments that consider multiple hazards and multiple assets. And perhaps uh, the, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure and perhaps other entities that are present uh, at, at the session might be an opportunity for us to uh, think about what type of guidance is needed and how do we apply it in practice. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we are coming to the end of our, of our session. Um, before we draw a session to a close, uh, I'd like to, well, first of all, thank all of our presenters today. Great, tremendous amount of effort and expertise and energy. I thank you, thank you so much for this. Uh, and we want to thank you in a special way. So if you wouldn't mind joining me, for those of you in the room, um, joining me on the stage, please. Um, we would like to um, just give you a token of our appreciation. Please join us. Uh, and while you're joining me on the stage, um, I just want to also let all of you know here in the room and online that tomorrow uh, there's going to be the next Pecha Kucha session. So they'll have a a high bar set, I think, to, to meet uh, after this session and will take place at 9.30 tomorrow. And also I remind everyone here in the, uh, in the room and in the conference to visit the exper experiential booth uh, ex exhibition that is across the hall. So thank you again. So it's my pleasure to, um, on behalf of CDRI, uh, just uh, give you this, um, oh, this is actually not for you, sorry, Regina, <laughs> there's names on it, so Dr. Hearth. So this is uh, a ch certificate, so we planted a tree, and we, we, we did, on behalf of CDRI, this is, it will be tree planted in your name, and this is a certificate that attests this, and uh, I'm going to just, uh, oh, Regina, that's yours. Regina, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sur. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And uh, Asta. Thank you so much for your contribution. That's a lovely token of appreciation. Dr. Kumar Ari. Thank you. Uh, Magda. Thank you so much for all you've done today. And Jin Sun. Thank you, Jin Sun. And then finally, mine. <laughs> well, I'll give, give it to myself. So join me once again. Round of applause for all our speakers today. Thank you so much. Uh, you've been great. And uh, stay, oh, thank you. And then stay tuned. More to come. And please enjoy the rest of the ICDRI conference. Thank you. Great. Well done. Photo. We, we,